you turn in your copies of the Confession back to chapter 15. Go ahead and read back through the chapter just for familiarization of it. I'm going to have you make some kind of marks and notes as you go through. Some reminders of where we've been already so far. But chapter 15 of the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, starting in paragraph 1, we read, Some of the elect are converted after their early years, having lived in the natural state for a time and served various evil desires and pleasures. God gives these repentance to life as part of their effectual calling. And you could... Uh, right above, after their early years, 10, uh, 3, 10 colon 3, which would remind you to go back to chapter 10 and paragraph 3, where we read, elect infants dying in infancy are regenerated and saved by Christ through the Spirit who works when and where and how he pleases. The same is true of every elect person who is incapable of being outwardly called by the ministry of the Word. That's chapter 10, uh, paragraph 3. And then back to chapter 15, we would continue, There is no one who does good and does not sin. Even the best may fall into great sins and offenses through the power and deceitfulness of the corruption in them, along with the strength of temptation. Therefore, God has mercifully provided in the covenant of grace, we'll see that twice in this chapter, you could put a little star above it, it's an important uh, term, the covenant of grace, that believers who sin and fall will be renewed through repentance to salvation. This saving repentance is a gospel grace in which those who are made aware by the Holy Spirit of the many evils of their sin, by faith in Christ, humble themselves for it with godly sorrow, hatred of it, and self-loathing. They pray for pardon and strength of grace and determine and endeavor by provisions from the Spirit to live before God in a well-pleasing way in everything. Repentance must continue, paragraph 4, throughout our lives because of the body of death and its activities. So it is everyone's duty to repent of each specific known sin specifically. Paragraph 5, God has made full provision through Christ in the covenant of grace, we'll start there again, to preserve believers in their salvation. Thus, although there is no sin so small that it is undeserving of damnation, yet there is no sin so great that it will bring damnation on those who repent. This makes the constant preaching of repentance necessary. Almighty God, would you be merciful to your servant, whose spirit is willing but whose body is weak. And would you be merciful to your flock this afternoon? Would your truth prevail? Would it edify? Would it challenge? Would it do all that for which it is set forth? We know that it will not return to you void. And we thank you for that, for that truth, for that confidence as especially as, as a, a preacher, for uh, without that, it all would be vanity. If it were simply based on the efforts of man, all would, be, all would be vanity and hopeless. But since it is based upon your sovereignty, who you are, that you accomplish all that you determine uh, beforehand to do, we can do this, we can, we can embark together uh, in unity, in seeking truth, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the honor of Jesus Christ, knowing that you will uh, so work in us that, we, that, we, that those things will be achieved. Um, we pray that we would be humble to submit to your timing and when you have determined to grant these things. But we ask for unity and truth. We ask for that today. You who are the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We love you and praise you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Continuing our course through the 15th chapter of the Confession, uh, the elders at Brookside considered it an opportune time to pause and consider, or really reconsider, another doctrine which is also presented to us in this document. That is the doctrine of, of, the, of God's covenant. Of God's covenant. If you recall from last week, we sought to understand the wording of the first paragraph of chapter 15, right? We were trying to understand what's really going on here in the first paragraph. A little difficult to understand. 
And in so doing, we examined, in order to understand that, we examined, as we just did, we went back to chapter 10, um, the status of elect infants who die in their infancy. <clears throat> elect infants who die in their infancy. So we have infants in our purview already. And the covenant of grace was also mentioned as that in which repentance is granted to the elect as part of their effectual calling. So, having infants and covenants on the brain uh, now seems as good a time as any to address what is perhaps the most distinguishing aspect of Reformed Baptist theology from the rest of the Reformed tradition. What is perhaps the mo that which distinguishes us the most from the rest of the Reformed tradition, and that is credo-baptism, more commonly today known as believers-only baptism. If you are not aware already, nearly every other Reformed camp holds to what has been called Pado-Baptist theology. Uh, nearly every other Reformed camp holds to that, among other things. Pado-Baptist theology teaches that the children of believers ought to be entered into the New Covenant by what those who hold to this theological framework see as the sign of the covenant, namely baptism. In other words, Reformed Presbyterians, as well as the Dutch, Scottish, German, and Swiss Reformed all generally believe in paedo-baptism, more commonly known as infant baptism. Now, this difference between credo-baptists and paedo-baptists is not a small one, as we will see. It's not a small one. And sadly, many today are being lured into that false doctrine, into the doctrine of infant baptism. I was just on a, on a site the other day, and in the comments of the video, on that site, several said that they were once Reformed Baptists holding to credo-baptism, but now they're a pedo baptist It was comment after comment like that. And uh, if you're members here, some of you know that this has touched us here at uh, Brookside as well. Our forefathers in the faith suffered and were persecuted for this doctrinal difference. Reformed Baptists in history were persecuted and suffered for this doctrinal difference probably more than any other and often at the hands of pedo baptists And though the shadow of those atrocities should not be cast on present-day believers in infant baptism, of course, right? The sins of, we're not like the, the, the liberal uh, thought culture today where you know, people, we should pay for uh, uh, slavery in the past or anything like that. But that shadow is not cast upon present-day pedo baptists we must understand what it is our predecessors fought for and won. We're going to do honor to them, those who've gone before. We should know what it is they fought for and why. Why they were willing to lay down their life, even their very lives. And so my intention this afternoon is to present to you only three of the, what we would believe to be many reasons that infant baptism cannot be a biblical doctrine. Why it cannot be. There are other reasons, but I think that these three will give us as good a foundation as any for contending for the faith once delivered to the saints. But before doing so, I want to say a few things. And before saying those things, I want to say one thing. So I have a few things to say, but before that I'm going to say one thing. I hate, and I believe that God hates, unnecessary qualifications. Unnecessary qualifications. I think it was Bodhi Bakum who said in one of his sermons that, that, that many sermons die the death of a thousand qualifications, right? Um, what he meant when he said that was many times if a preacher uh, has enough courage, so, so first of all, if he even has enough courage to speak about certain cultural issues like homosexuality, for example, he will very often today begin that sermon by qualifying what he's about to say with things like, now, I, I don't hate homosexuals. So he's about to preach on the sin of homosexuality, and he feels the need to start with, I don't hate homosexuals, I have many friends who are homosexuals, things like that, right? That's what Bodhi meant by uh, a sermon dying the death of a thousand qualifications. And no one listening to a sermon should really care about what the preacher thinks about homosexuality. And no one who cares about what God thinks would give a hoot about how many homosexual friends the preacher has. Who cares? about those things. We don't gather in the name of King Jesus to hear about the preacher's opinions or personal life. We gather to hear, thus saith the Lord. Amen. Amen. 
And if you think that I need to say that I don't hate pedo-baptists before going on, that would be a qualification, and you need to grow up. <laughs> you need to grow up. Disagreeing with someone doesn't mean you hate them unless you're five years old. And I'm happy to tell you that what I'm about to say now, so that was the first thing. I have a few things still to say. What I'm about to say, these are not qualifications. These are not qualifications. They are not apologies for our sincerely and unashamedly held doctrine of credo-baptism. I'm not sorry that I believe in believers-only baptism because I believe it is what the Word of God teaches. But knowing what is in the heart of man, as revealed in the Word of God, I think certain warnings may be warranted before such a study. First, we owe, that is everyone sitting here in this room, owe a great deal to the Pado baptist brethren who have gone before us, as, as well as many of them who are alive today. We owe much to them. And that is what they are. By the way, they are brethren. In case we need to establish that first, they are brethren. The difference between us is not one of primary urgency. It matters, of course, otherwise we wouldn't be spending our time this afternoon, uh, this afternoon going over this doctrinal difference. But whomever Christ will commune with, I will commune with. How can I refuse the right hand of fellowship from one for whom Christ died? Hopefully all of us would say we cannot. I cannot refuse the right hand of fellowship for one for whom Christ died, from one for whom Christ died. Since most of those under the Reformed banner have been Pado baptists the vast majority, most of us who are students of the Reformation and Reformed traditions have benefited mightily from them. Honor to whom honor is due. Second, before you go out, go out from here and disparage our Pado baptist brethren for the error of infant baptism, be sure that you are living out those gospel truths that they emphasized far more than infant baptism. Holiness, righteousness, godliness, being students of God's word, being committed to prayer, faithful in family worship, committed to the church, faithful to the people of God, and so on. If you are not seeking to have these things demonstrated in your life, then take the log out of your own eye. That's actually one of the times that that verse can be applied very accurately. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 2. It doesn't say you're only a little. It says you are nothing if you have not love. And so here's a word for any who would be students of sound doctrine but not practitioners of love. Go home, you noisy gong. If you will be only a student of sound doctrine, but not a practitioner of love, go home, you noisy gong, and do not return until you have learned the melody of love. Are you able to teach, but unable to love those you teach? You're a clanging symbol. If after our study you're able to refute infant baptism, but you do not love God by keeping his commandments... You are nothing. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others, Matthew 23, 23. So notice our Lord, our Lord didn't say that the less weighty matters can be neglected or they're unimportant. Don't worry, don't spend your time on that. No, he said, these you ought to have done without neglecting the others. All scripture, not most of it, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable. All is profitable. 2 Timothy 3.16, but there are weightier things, and those shouldn't be neglected in the course of pursuing the less weighty things. But we are lazy creatures, and it is much easier to tithe than it is to love. May we guard against such hypocrisy here. Third, in case there is any confusion on this point, it should be said that our uh, Pado baptist brethren do not believe that baptism saves the infant to whom it is administered. Okay? 
maybe for some of you, infant baptism is a little bit unfamiliar, but it's, un it's important for you to understand at the outset that our Pado Baptist brethren do not believe that baptism saves the infant to whom it is ad administered. Baptismal regeneration is a false doctrine that's held by uh, cults like the Church of Christ, okay, and not by Reformed Pado Baptists. And neither do Pado Baptists believe that baptism washes away original sin, as the Roman Catholic believes. Okay, they don't believe that either. Reformed Pado Baptists believe that the children of believers are brought into the new covenant by baptism, uh, just and they would say just as the children of the descendants of Abraham were brought into that covenant by circumcision. This, I know it's a very quick summary, but that's essentially what they believe. Time constrains us so that we'll not be able to delve deeply into the presuppositions that undergird the Pado Baptist position, such as a strict continuity between the Old and New Covenants or the administerial nature of the Minor Covenants. If you want a refresher on that, by the way, on the Minor Covenants, we do have a seven-part series on our YouTube channel. Uh, it just happens to be on Chapter 7, a seven-part series on Chapter 7 of the Confession, which is entitled God's Covenant. You can go back there and, and have a refresher on, on what, what is required for uh, a covenant to be uh, ratified and so forth. Um, you can see the difference between the covenants. You can see the continuity between the covenants. A covenant is, is a covenant is a covenant. Throughout, you know, it's, the covenant still has a certain framework and definitional uh, reality. But time constrains us from delving deeply into that here now. And just as we who have come to an understanding of the biblical nature of the doctrines of grace, I think, I think this is a important thing to understand before we embark. Just as we who have come to an understanding of the biblical nature of the doctrines of grace, that's shorthand referring to the, the sovereignty of God and salvation and election, uh, the utter inability and unwillingness of man um, to, to choose God, to pursue God, right? That's, those are the, that's what we mean when we refer to, refer to the doctrines of grace. Just as we, when we come to a difficult to understand passage of scripture, what happens? What do you do? You should be able to answer this. What do I do when I come to a, a, a passage of Scripture, or maybe someone brings one to me that's difficult to understand in light of what I already know to be true? Well, we say, well, it cannot mean that because of this, this thing that I already know to be true. Right? If I come to a difficult passage, one of the things I can do, even if that, diff even if that passage is, is still somewhat dark to me, I, I'm still struggling with it, I can say, I can, I can begin to to check off the list of the things it can't mean by the things that I already know to be true. I can say, well, it can't mean that because of, of this. Or it must mean this because of that. Right? We, can, we can follow our presuppositions. And so an Arminian may bring to you a text uh, that if you're not adept at understanding how to look at the context and so forth, may sound at first like it's teaching that the will of man is able to choose God or God is not sovereign over salvation. If you have come already to understand the doctrines of grace to be biblical, and you would say, well, however it sounds at the outset, I know for one thing it doesn't mean Arminianism, right? Because that has been demonstrably proven to me to be false. And so I need to take those presuppositions into more difficult to understand passages. And I think that the three reasons which will be given shortly for why paedobaptism cannot be biblical are considered, when they're considered, the only consistent conclusion will be just that, 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 it, that it cannot be biblical. Whatever rebuttals, proponents of infant baptism might give to you, if they cannot refute these three, whatever other rebuttals they may give, whatever, what about this passage, what about this, if they cannot refute these, these three, their doctrine ought to be rejected in favor of the biblical teaching that only those who have been granted faith to believe on Jesus Christ are proper subjects of the ordinance of baptism and members of the new covenant. So without any further ado, in my longer introductions, the three reasons are as follows. First, three reasons why paedobaptism cannot be biblical. First, paedobaptism cannot be true because of what the Bible teaches about the constituency of the people of God in the New Covenant. Second, paedobaptism cannot be true because of what the Bible teaches about the mediatorial efficacy of Christ. And third, paedobaptism cannot be true because it amounts to will 
worship or a violation of the regulative principle. So first, going down through our list, first, paedo-baptism cannot be true because of what the Bible teaches about the constituency of God's people in the New Covenant, or in other words, of, of what kind of people will make up what is defined as God's people uh, in the New Covenant. Scripture teaches that the New Covenant will be made up of those who have been born again. The New Covenant will be made up of those who have been born again. If someone is in the New Covenant, they have been born again. That's, that's the shorthand. This expectation was first given in the Old Testament in Jeremiah chapter 31, and you can turn there and read along. Jeremiah chapter 31. Starting in verse 31, we'll just read through 34. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. This is going to be the difference. I will put my law within them, and I will write, on, write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. They will all know me from the least of them to the great greatest, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. We believe this passage to be clear. The difference between old, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant is this. All will know God. All will know God. No one in the New Covenant will have to be taught about God because they will already know Him. They will know Him because they will have had their iniquities forgiven and their sins will be remembered no more. Now, according to the New Testament, whom is this describing? Whom are those who know God? If you were to take this definition and, and, and look for other passages in the New Testament, who are those who know God and have had their iniquities forgiven and their sins forgotten? Who are those who know God and have had their sins forgiven and their iniquities forgotten? Or the iniquities forgiven and their sins forgotten? They are the converted elect, most specifically, the converted elect, not even just the elect because we are, we are elect from the foundation of the earth. But specifically the converted elect. They are those who have been born again according to the foreknowledge of God to eternal life. That is those who would fit that definition. They were once dead in their trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2, 1, Ephesians 2, 1, just like the rest of mankind. They had no understanding, Romans 3.11, not even the beginning of knowledge, Romans 3.18, which is the fear of God, Proverbs 1.7, but they are those who have been born again to eternal life, which is to know God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. John 17, verse 3. These are those who make up the constituency of the new covenant. To Jesus Christ, all the prophets bear witness. Acts 10, 43. All the prophets bear witness. That would include Jeremiah. All the prophets bear witness to Jesus Christ that... Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So, receiving forgiveness for sins would, would re require believing in his name, knowing him. Going back to the language of Jeremiah, this, this is those, these are those who are of the new covenant. They are those who believe in his name, and only those who believe in his name have their iniquities forgiven and their sins forgotten. And so it is abundantly clear that those who will be members of the new covenant that was promised in Jeremiah 31 will be believers, for it is only believers who know God and who have the forgiveness of sins. And this expectation is actually continued throughout the New Testament. Nowhere, we assert, nowhere is there a distinction made between converted elect persons and those who are of the New Covenant. 
Nowhere is a distinction made between converted elect persons and the members of the new covenant. Sure, there are those in the visible church who are false professors, and they are to be identified, and often are, and expelled from the communion of the true church. But these were never members of the new covenant to begin with. Just as we would tell uh, someone who claimed, you know, someone who says, well, of course you lose your salvation, right? This person said they were a Christian, and now they're not living anything like it. They said now they reject Christ. We would say, what? They, yeah, they never were of him, right? They never, they went out from us because they were not of us. They never were a Christian to begin with. Well, people being expelled from the communion of the visible church, are simple, those are simply demonstrating that they are not members, never were, of the new covenant to begin with. 1 Peter chapter 2 is one passage in the New Testament. 1 Peter chapter 2, where the people of God are described. Listen to this passage and the similarities between it and Jeremiah 31. We're going to read verses 4 through 10. 1 Peter chapter, chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumbled because they disobey the word as they were destined to. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. There's only two classes of people in the world, those who are not God's people and those who are God's people. And those who are God's people are a, a royal priesthood. They're not a mixed multitude. They are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Priests know God. They know him. They know what it is to offer sacrifices and, 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 the, and the, meaning, the necessity of the sacrifice, which is sin. They know of the need for the forgiveness of sins. There are those who are not a people, and now they are the people of God. There are those who have not received mercy and those who have received mercy. Only two groups of people in the world. Just as the stones of the Solomonic temple were prepared at the quarry, this is, uh, you can read about this in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 7, the stones for the Solomonic temple were actually prepared at the quarry, they were shaped at the quarry, so that neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron was heard in the house while it was being built. Even so, the living stones, the covenant people of God, are prepared, are born again, altered, changed, before being brought into the spiritual house. There are no unregenerate elect or non-elect in the new covenant. And to say so, brothers and sisters, is to make the new covenant into an empty and meaningless, meaningless thing. It's to make the new covenant into an empty and meaningless thing. For what would be the difference between membership in the new covenant and membership in the world if paedo-baptism were true? Both have elect, both have non-elect. Both have regenerate, both have unregenerate and unregenerate. But God's people are unique from the world, set apart according to his covenant of grace. Second. So first was the paedo-baptism contradicts what the Bible teaches about the constituency of the people of God in the new covenant. Second, paedo-baptism cannot be true because of what the Bible teaches about the mediatorial efficacy of Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 8, Hebrews chapter 8, we see Jeremiah 31, this is where we began, we see that quoted, that's verses 8 through 12 of, Jeremiah, uh, of uh, Hebrews chapter 8. So that section is actually quoted in Hebrews chapter 8. And just before that we read in verse 6, 
these words, that Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old, than the old ministry, as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. What is the ministry that Christ has obtained? What is his ministry? Well, and if you were to go a chapter ahead in Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 15, that ministry is reiterated a little more clearly. Therefore he, that is Christ, is the mediator of a new covenant. That is his ministry. His ministry is... His ministerial work is to be the mediator of the new covenant. And note, pay attention, that the word of God does not say that Christ is the mediator only of the elect. It does not say that, students of God's word. It says that Christ is the mediator of the new covenant. He is therefore the mediator of all who have membership in the new covenant. If unregenerate infants can be baptized into the new covenant, then Christ is their mediator. Just as much as he is the mediator of unregenerate adults. Uh, I'm sorry, of regenerate adults. Unregenerate infants, if, they are, if it is true that they're brought into the new covenant... And that he is their mediator as much as he is the mediator of regenerate adults. And if some of those infants grow up rejecting him, showing that they were never of the elect, then what must be said of Christ's mediation for them? So if the framework is true, pedo baptism, that unregenerate infants can be brought into the new covenant, and then some of them, and this certainly happens, some of them grow up to reject Christ, then what must be said? of Christ's mediation for them. It must be said that he failed in his mediatorial work. It must be said that he failed in his mediatorial work regarding the non-elect who are, according to Pato baptist theology, members of the covenant that Christ mediates. But brothers and sisters, King Jesus doesn't fail at anything. He doesn't fail at anything. Our mediator does not fail at anything. And the Father never fails to hear the mediation of the Son. Now, some Pado baptists see this obvious problem and try to say, against the clear teaching of Scripture, that Christ is not the mediator of those in the New Covenant who are not elect. But work with me through this for a moment. If I were to say to you that there was a king, there was this king, and in his kingdom there were two groups of people, one for whom he provided protection and justice and sustenance and everything else that a king is supposed to provide. So for these people, he provides all of these things. And another group for whom he does, does not provide protection, justice, or su sustenance. What would you say about such a king who has two such groups within his kingdom? You would say, I would certainly say, that he was either a bad king for the second group, or he was no king for them at all. Either he was a bad king for the second group, or he is no king for them at all. Or if I was to say that there was a father, and he had two children, and one child he loved and protected and provided for, and the other he did not, what would you say? Would you not say that he was either a bad father to the second child or that he must be no father at all? And so if the new covenant has two groups of people, one which receives saving grace and electing love and mediation and intercession, and one which does not, our Pado baptist brethren must forgive us if we understand them to be saying that Christ is either a bad mediator for the second group, or he is not their mediator at all. And since Scripture does not allow for the second option, the conclusion must be that Pedro Baptist theology teaches that Christ is a failure as a mediator, at least in part. For those in his covenant who are not elect, he is nothing other than a bad mediator. 
if paedo-baptist theology is true. But praise God, it is not true. All whom the Father has given to Christ will come to him, and he will never be cast out, but will be raised up on the last day. John chapter 6, verse 37 and 39. Oh, wait, wait that's about election. Well, if our Pado baptist brethren want to attempt to claim that the members of the New Covenant have not been given by the Father to the mediator of the New Covenant, we must only leave them to their efforts to stretch clear truth to fit their unsound doctrine. Thirdly and lastly, Pado baptism cannot be true because it amounts to will worship or a violation of the regulative principle. We don't have time to go back into an examination of the regulative principle of worship. We've watched videos on this. We've had teachings on it that you can find online. But in order to understand how infant baptism is a violation of the regulative principle, you have to at least have a brief summary in case you're not familiar with it. What does it mean to say that paedo or infant baptism is a violation of the regulative principle of worship that amounts to will worship? Well, the regulative principle of worship is a biblical doctrine given to us throughout Scripture. It's, it's repeatedly demonstrated to us that teaches that only that which God has prescribed or commanded should be offered to him in worship. Very simple. You want to worship God? You're only, if, if you're actually going to call it your worship, you only do that which he's commanded. Very simple. We are not to imagine what would please God in worship. He has already sufficiently revealed that to us in his word. Praise, praise God that he's done that so we may know what is pleasing in his sight, what duties are required of man. And we are certainly not to offer up to him what merely pleases us. The confession puts it this way. If you want to turn in your copies of the confession to chapter 22. If your Bible's falling apart, your life probably isn't. I don't know what it means if your confession's falling apart. <laughs> you probably say it means you're brainwashed. Chapter 22, we'll just read the first paragraph. The light of nature demonstrates that there is a God who has lordship and sovereignty over all. He is just and good and does good to everyone. Therefore, he should be feared, loved, praised, called on, trusted in, and served with all the heart and all the soul and all the strength. But... The acceptable way to worship the true God is instituted by him, and it is delimited by his own revealed will. Thus, he may not be worshipped according to human imagination or inventions or the suggestions of Satan, nor through any visible representations, nor in any other way that is not prescribed in the Holy Scriptures. God gets to say what worship is, not us. So you could paraphrase that whole paragraph. God used to say what worship is, not us. And he has put, God has put, his displeasure for violations of this principle on display in terrifying ways. In terrifying ways. In Leviticus chapter 10, we would read, if we were to turn there, and you, and you can write a note there, look it up for yourselves, we would read that God killed two priests for offering worship that was not prescribed by him. He killed them. In the ESV, it's, it's called unauthorized fire. They offer, offered up unauthorized, unauthorized fire, Nadab and Abihu did. It wasn't even that they offered up something that God had commanded against. It's not what they did. God wasn't like, don't give me that, and like, well, we're going to give it to you. No, it was, it was just something that he hadn't even mentioned, God hadn't mentioned. They offered to him something that wasn't authorized by him, and he killed them. He killed them. There are other examples of this in Scripture in which we see that even good intentions don't change the fact that God is provoked by that which he is not authorized in worship to him. Even good intentions don't alter the fact that God is provoked by worship that he is not authorized. In the New Testament, we have this command from our Lord. This is Matthew chapter 28. Verses 19 through 20. Should be familiar to many of you. Matthew chapter 8, verses 19 through 20. Go therefore 
and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Notice the order. Number one, make disciples. Number two, baptize them. This is an explicit command. This is a command. This is a command from King Jesus for the carrying out of one of the ordinances of the new covenant. By the God who burned two priests alive for offering unauthorized fire. The same one who gave this command is the one who burned two priests alive for offering him unauthorized fire. Make disciples, baptize them. Make disciples, baptize them. In John 4, 1, we learn that this was the order which was always carried out by our Lord and his disciples. Make disciples, baptize them. And this is the same practice that is carried out by the apostles through the book of Acts, and nothing in the epistles would hint otherwise. And so, being unable to find infant baptism in the Bible, our Pado baptist brethren will again have to forgive us for being unwilling to accept mere logical deduction, especially when the necessity of the inference can be questioned or denied. They'll have to forgive us if we're unwilling to accept mere logical deduction, especially when the necessity of what they're inferring, what they're presupposing, can be questioned or denied. In the fear of God here, we Reformed Baptists stand unwilling to offer up to God that which he has not commanded. Amen. Lest he write Ichabod above the doors of our churches or send the fire of his indignation upon us. And so, brethren, whatever else might be said about infant baptism, if our Pado baptist co-heirs cannot show us how their system does not contradict what the Bible teaches about the constituency of God's covenant people, how it doesn't limit the mediatorial efficacy of Christ, and how it doesn't violate the regulative principle, then we must stand in the true Reformed tradition, saying with that great and the first of the Reformers, unless I am convinced by Scripture and plain reason, my conscience is captive to the word of God. Here we stand, we can do no other. In the fear of God, here we stand. Out of love for him, out of a desire to know that which he requires of us, and out of, out of a fear of him, having no command in the New Testament to baptize infants, but explicit commands to baptize believers. Lord willing, we will return to our study of chapter 15, next week. Until then, you who belong to Christ the Mediator, may your consciences be purified from dead works to serve the living God. And to those who are yet lost in the world, dead in their trespasses and sins, there is only one Mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. You are in need of him. You are in need of him because you are in need of mediation. Because you have broken God's law. Therefore, you need a mediator, and you cannot mediate for yourself. Turn to Christ today and be saved. He, the mediator of the new covenant, does not fail. Let's pray. Almighty God, use the efforts of this worm, as you will, for your glory, for the good of your people. We love you. We thank you that... You are the all-knowing one. We can, we can rest in the knowledge that you have revealed to us, that you are working all things together for the good of, good of your people, uh, that one day there will be unity, no more, no more divisions amongst your people, uh, that we will get to see how truly good it is when brother, brethren dwell together in unity for eternity. We are committed to that day, and uh, it is... The, by efforts like these that we uh, seek to participate with our king in the purification of his, of his bride. Uh, 
grant that you would do that in mighty ways here at Brookside Baptist. For your glory alone, in Jesus' name.